equivalent, so the three statements, let me remind you, were one was the statement that higher cohomologies of your coherent sheaf twisted by uh, L hat dual is equal to zero for every i greater than zero. Uh, so here L is sufficiently ample line bundle on a hat, and then L hat is the vector bundle on, on A that you get by doing the Fourier Mukai transform, and we had this property that if uh, phi L is the map from a hat to A, then phi L upper star of L hat dual was the direct sum of a zero of L copies of L itself. So up to, up to a finite total map, this uh, decomposes as a direct sum of ample line bundles. So that was one condition. The second condition was that the Fourier Mukai transform of the derived dual of this coherent sheaf uh, is actually a sheaf, and it lives in degree G. And uh, the Fomatsuki, let me, uh, uh, Kenji, there we go. Uh, and the third condition is that uh, the co-dimension of the support of the uh, um, sheaves that I get by taking the cohomologies of the Fourier Mutri transform of F without any dual. So the co-dimension of these supports is greater or equal to pi for every i greater than zero. I'm not including i equals zero because it's a trivial statement. So these three are equivalent, and so uh, if um, f, this coherent sheaf, satisfies any one of these properties, one and hence all, of these properties, uh, then we say that uh, F is a generic vanishing sheaf. So just write GV is just short for generic vanishing. Okay, so these are going to be the kind of sheets that I'm interested in, and um, I want to uh, prove that they satisfy some other properties that we expect from Green and Lazarsfeld uh, um, generic uh, vanishing uh, statements. So if F on coherent sheet from a vision variety A is a generic vanishing sheaf, then we have an inclusion between the low psi, so V0 of F contains V1 of F, contains V2 of F, and so forth, where, let me remind you, that VI of F is a cohomological support low psi, so it's a set of P's in pick 0 of A, such that the corresponding cohomology does not vanish. And roughly speaking, you expect these VIs to be more or less the same as the support of our IS hat of F. Well, not exactly the same. We know that the support of our IS hat of, is hat of F is contained inside of these. So these guys, by commodity base change, contain the support of our I as hat of f, and sometimes you can show that they're equal. Um, okay, so I want to show, I want to prove to you uh, why these are uh, one contains any other. Okay, so uh, so let's suppose that we have some point in one of these loci, the i of f, and uh, what do, what do we know then? Well, this tells us that. Hi of f tend to p. Uh, so I want to say not in here. So this will be zero. 
Okay, so maybe I should put it aside. I want to show that vi contains vi plus one, right? So that this statement is the same as saying that if some point is not in vi, then it's not in vi plus one. Okay, so I'm proving sort of the negative of the statement. So let me start with a point that's not in vi. I want to show that it's not in vi plus one. So not being in vi means that this uh, cohomology group is zero. And um, so let me sort of compute this in a fancy way. So let me put the zero on this side because I'll, okay, so let me uh, uh, put a dual. We'll see in a second why I want that. So this is the same as saying H minus I of DK of R gamma F tensor P is equal to zero. Okay, so I've essentially done nothing, uh, but let me explain. So um, these are just, uh, these commodity groups are just vector spaces over the ground field K. So um, dualizing a different notation for this, I could use a notation Ri gamma of F tensor P, right? That's, this is just a function of global section, the F direct. Okay, so if I write DK of that, I'm doing hom into K of these vector spaces, so I'm just taking the dual vector spaces, um, but um, um, when I write R gamma this way, so this guy here is a complex where in degree zero, it's uh, R zero gamma, in degree one, it's R one gamma, and just the maps, you can think of them as zero maps, uh, R two gamma, and so on. So when I dualize it, taking the dual, I'll get R zero gamma dual, zero map into a one gamma dual and so on. And then, so if I wanted to pick out the i-th cohomology, all these maps are zero, I, the i-th cohomology of this complex, uh, so the h minus i-th cohomology will pick out ri gamma dual, this will be in position minus i. So, uh, I don't know, this just seems like an extremely complicated way to write the dual of a vector space. But of course, the reason I've done it this way is that now I want to uh, apply growth in the duality and I want to do it in a way that I don't have to think about the shifts. So if I set it up this way, I won't have to think about the shifts. Um, so um, this is going to be the same as R minus I gamma of DA of F tensor P. So let's see, did I uh, do it correctly? So I want to switch the derived on K with the uh, push forward, and Grotting duality tells me that then I need to put the derived on the M variety here, derived dual on A, and this H minus I, I'm just putting it together, I'm taking the minus I cohomology of this guy, so I just write that as R minus I gamma, and notice that this is just harm into O of K, so this is the same thing as DA of F tensor P dual. Um, it's clear what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to relate it uh, somehow to this DA of F here. Okay, so, um, so I have vanishing of, okay, so this is a complex and I have vanishing of cohomology of this complex. So I claim that by um, cohomology and base change, um, um, this, uh, how do I want to say it? Um, yes, so in particular, this, um, I should have avoided doing this on this one. Seems like it's not uh, uh, telling me anything uh, so interesting. I think what I want to do is I want to apply cohomology and base change to the previous one. So 
I could look at r minus i minus 1 of s hat of d a f tensor k p and dual and the natural map into r minus i minus 1 gamma of d a of f uh, tensor p dual. Okay? So the usual way that you may be used to seeing cohomology and base change is when instead of a complex you have a sheaf, but it's the same exact kind of statement. Um, so uh, there's a natural map that compares the, um, um, the I minus J push forward of DI of F tends to the point carré with the corresponding cohomology group. Now, what does cohomology and base change say? Uh, it tells me that if the previous map is an isomorphism, which it is, right? So at one level before, you have R minus I, same kind of stuff, uh, tensor K P dual into R minus I corresponding cohomology group. Okay. So when I look at the previous level, um, I, I, I see that um, I, I have, for example, if I is greater than zero, I have an isomorphism, and if I is equal to zero, I have a surjection, just because the guy on the right-hand side is zero. So cohomology and base change will then tell me um, that the previous step is surjective. Okay, so this is an isomorphism. Even when i equals zero, it's an isomorphism. Why? Because if these groups are zero, it means that this sheaf has to be zero nearby, right? Because they're constant equal to zero. Okay, so this map here is onto, and so uh, is isomorphism. And so the conclusion is that this map here is subjective by cohomology and base change. That's great because the left-hand side is zero, right? As long as, of course, I'm going to start with some i greater or equal to zero. So this is i minus 1. Uh, minus i minus 1 is less or equal to minus 1. So I know that the corresponding cohomology groups are zero. And um, um, then the left-hand side is zero. It's subjective, which forces the right-hand side to be zero. But I've already, by running back through this isomorphism, the right-hand side is just H I plus 1 F tensor P hat tensor P dual. And so this is saying precisely that P does not belong to V I plus 1. And that's what I wanted to prove. So if you say it right, all you're using is the fact that uh, uh, if this group is zero, you know that the cohomology and base change kind of statement is you have an isomorphism, and then it tells you that the next map is subjective for the little group on the left is zero. That's, that's all there is about that. And it's not entirely impossible that I have uh, one shift wrong. So, uh, in fact, I can probably already see one wrong shift, but maybe I. So, um, the way I've set it up, this one should not be an RG. This one should be an R0. Because this dualizing functor has a shift by G places. So I, easy to get confused by that. OK, so the one contains another. This gives us an immediate nice corollary, which is uh, even fancier non-vanishing. So corollary, uh, if F some coherent sheaf on an abelian variety is generic vanishing, then it actually has some non-vanishing property. So then H0 of F tensor P is non-zero for some P in pick zero A. Proof, uh, if this were not the case, then v0 of f will be empty, right? Right, Because if these guys are always 0, that's precisely saying that v0 is empty. 
But since the V0s contain each other, this means that VI of F are all empty for every I greater or equal to zero. And this means that F is the zero sheet, right? Because you see this, by cohomology and base change, this immediately tells you that uh, RS of F is equal to zero. So F is minus one A upper star R S R S hat F shifted by G. If this guy is zero, then F has to be zero. Right. So, so um, that's sort of uh, a very, very uh, useful and strong non-vanishing result. Okay, so the next thing I should do is I should show that um, there are actually some geometric objects that are generic vanishing sheaves, so that the statement is useful somehow. And I've already alluded to this, but maybe I should do the complete proof. So here's a proposition. Uh, I claim that um, every, so let's suppose that A from X to A is a um, morphism from, let's say, yes. yes. Well, otherwise, I can say that if V0 is empty, then F has to be 0. That's the right. only exception. Correct? Correct. Right? My conclusion was that F is 0. So I, it's not a contradiction unless I make it a contradiction. Very good. Okay. So suppose I have a morphism. So in this setting, I'm assuming that X is a complex projective variety, and I'm assuming that it's smooth. And of course, I'm assuming that A is an abelian variety. So typically, you're interested in the Albanese morphism. Then the statement is that then Ri, a lower star of omega x, is a generic vanishing sheaf. And of course, you can uh, make fancier versions of this um, you know, with multiply ideals. Anything that looks like a canonical line bundle higher direct images will, will have these kind of properties. Um, so, so let me prove that. Um, so what do I need to show in order to prove it? What I really want is that when I compute higher cohomology of uh, I, a lower star of omega x tensor L hat U, this should be zero for every I greater than zero and L sufficiently ample. And in fact, J. You, sorry? J, yes. You should forget about L sufficiently ample because um, if you can prove it for L sufficient, you, it's going to hold for L sufficiently ample if and only if it holds for all L, actually. So one can show that. I don't want to show that. So in practice, I can only show this kind of statement if I can show it for all L. So I'm never going to worry about is L sufficiently ample. I'm just going to show it for all L ample. Wait, is it a fact? Yeah, it's a fact. But uh, So the proof of that fact is essentially the same as the proof of showing that this codimension statement implies the top one, right? Because this codimension statement is independent of L, right? So if, that, if the top one is equivalent to the bottom one, then it's for any L sufficiently ample, I guess, but it, it's really independent of L, the same kind of proof. Um, Okay, so how do you prove it? Um, well, you look at the following diagram. So you have map from X to A that we called A. Now we have the natural map from uh, A hat to A given by um, the uh, isogeny determined by L. So remember, this sends a point Y uh, to um, um, translation by Y 
applied to L tensor L dual, or maybe the L dual is on the other side. It's something along these lines. It doesn't matter what it's exactly. Um, so, right, so this is something in pig zero of A hat, which are identified with A. So the, you think of this as being belonging to pig zero of A hat, so A dual dual, and you identify with it. Okay, so now you can take the fiber product. Let's say X hat be the fiber product. Let's denote by A hat the induced morphism, and then we have another morphism here. Um, so, um, since we're in characteristic zero, we're over the complex numbers, uh, this map is a tau map, and so the fiber product is also an a tau map, in particular x hat is smooth. There's a lot of technicalities I don't need to worry about in characteristic zero. Um, so, uh, this is the vanishing I want. Now, um, um, I, I, it's enough to show that um, um, higher cohomologies of Ri a hat lower star omega x hat tensor phi L upper star L hat dual is equal to zero. So why is that? Well, so the claim is that this is going to be a direct sum of that point, right? So, why? Um, the map is finite, and um, so I would like to compute, uh, how should I put it? Let's compute uh, phi L lower star of R I A upper, A lower star omega X hat tensor phi L upper star L hat dual. Okay, so I claim that this is the same as R I A hat low star omega X tensor L hat dual tensor phi L lower star of O of A hat. Okay, so clearly I must be using the projection formula. Uh, so this would follow by the projection formula as soon as you realize that omega uh, x hat is just the pullback of omega x. So uh, uh, the main point here is to observe that omega x hat, omega x hat is actually the relative canonical bundle, and uh, it is just given by... Um, I'm going to have to give this map a name, psi maybe. Psi upper star of omega x. And so this is an easy exercise to check. Okay, there are no higher direct images because the map is finite. So that means that this cohomology group decomposes as a direct sum, right? So this, this guy here uh, has a sum and which is the O of A. So there's a natural inclusion which is split. And in fact, this is, if you want to, it's a direct sum of topologically trivial line bundles uh, on uh, A. Which topologically trivial line bundles? They're the ones which are in the kernel of the map uh, from of the map from pig zero of A to A hat of the pullback map. So of phi L upper star. Right. So in characteristic zero, the kernel is a finite, reduced, a nice finite subgroup of A, and this is just a direct sum of line bundles. Right? And so uh, if I prove this vanishing, not only am I proving this vanishing, but I'm also proving this vanishing tensored by any one of these topologically trivial line bundles. Okay. That must be correct. Wow, you have <laughs> good eyesight. Okay. Okay. Um, Suki is guaranteeing that there's no other typos. Okay. So, so I want to show that one, but you see now this guy here, I must have written it somewhere. So this group here, this guy here is a direct sum 
uh, of copies of L, H0 of L of them. So this group here is, in fact, a direct sum of H0 of L copies of Hj um, Ri a hat low star omega x hat tensor L. And each one of these is zero by Collard vanishing. So, so we're saying that Collard vanishing implies that each one of these sheaves is a generic vanishing sheaf. And so by formal argument on an obedient variety, it satisfies any of those three properties, and those three properties um, are correct analogs of green and lazar cell genetic vanishing. Um, okay, so, um, so, you know, it takes a bit of staring at these to convince yourself that they're the correct analog of green and lazar cell vanishing. Here's one of the reasons. Um, one statement that I haven't showed you is um, the co-dimension statement. So let me do that next. Um, Here's a corollary. So we have A from X to A, just as before. Uh, then I claim that the codimension of the loci di of omega X is at least I minus the dimension of X um, plus the dimension of A of X. Or in other words, maybe it's better to write it as I minus K, where K is dimension of X minus dimension of A of X. So this is the dimension of the general fiber of the albanese matrix. If this were the albanese, it could be any map to an abelian variety, but the typical situation, you're interested in this in the albanese. Um, so, you know, maybe I should just write the I omega X. You should really think of it as the P's in P0 of A such that HI of omega X and P is non-zero. Now, of course, if it's the Albanese map, then P0 of A is identified with P0 of X. There is no ambiguity. If it's not the Albanese map, where do these loci live? I'm really thinking of them as living inside of A hat. Okay, so let's do the proof. So by Collard's theorem, I know that R A lower star of omega X splits as a direct sum of, maybe this is more appropriate, R I F lower star omega X shifted by minus I, I equals zero to uh, K. Okay, so there's a couple of comments to be made. You know, this is an element of the derived category. You really have to think of it as a complex. Uh, this is just a direct sum of line bound of coherent sheaves shifted by I. So for example, if you apply to any functor to this, you just get the sum of the corresponding functors. I'll do that in a second with the cohomology functor, but you know, and any spectral sequence that you apply is automatically degenerate. The other comment is why does the sum stop at K? Right? K is just the dimension of the generic fiber. The reason is uh, since our I, F low star omega X, are torsion free by Collard's theorem, that implies that our I, F low star omega X, is equal to zero for every I greater than K. Right? Because if I is greater than the dimension of the generic fiber, then that sheaf has to be torsion, but it's not possible because by class theorem, the torsion free. I guess A is equal to X. Yes. 
Okay, and I haven't posted the updated notes, unluckily. Uh, I did make this typo and many others in the notes, so as soon as I post them, that typo will be corrected. Um, okay, so then what do I, uh, how am I going to use this? Well, um, I want to compute uh, cohomology groups H um, J of omega x tensor A upper star of P, right? I'm trying to understand where these groups do not vanish. And so this will be a direct sum of H I equals zero to K, H J minus I, R I, A lower star omega X tensor P, where I've used a projection formula to take the P, A upper star of P when I push it forward, it comes out. And this J minus I is coming from this shift here. Um, okay, so great. So now we know that, um, okay, so now when I look at, um, I have made an unfortunate choice with J's and I's. Now I'm using J for the cohomology instead of I, but I think we can all live with that. So now if I want to compute VJ of omega X, so I'm looking for where these groups do not vanish. This group not vanishing is precisely the same as one of these groups not vanishing. So this is the union I equals zero to K of V J minus I R I A plus star omega X tensor P. So each one of these um, has co-dimension I, but now you see um, the sum goes from zero to K. So um, when, sorry, for the mention J minus I, okay? So when I is zero, it's the biggest co-dimension. So the, the worst case is where the I is equal to K. And so the co-dimension, uh, so the worst one, is uh, V J minus K of R uh, K, there is no P here, of R uh, K A lower star omega X, which has co-dimension uh, J minus K, and hopefully, so the J now is doing the role of the I, and the K is dimension of X minus dimension of X. So the numbers actually worked out for once. Right, so the co-dimension of this guy is the, uh, the, the smallest co-dimension of these guys and the smallest one is J minus K. Okay. Um, in a similar vein, uh, let me use this to prove um, um, a theorem of Green and Lazarsfeld on um, the geometry of irregular varieties, which I alluded to in the first lecture, but I didn't even state. But um, so this is more evidence that we're recovering more or less everything that you need to know about generic vanishing theorem. So this theorem is due to Green and Lazarsfeld. So let's say that W is an irreducible component of one of these low side VI of omega X. Uh, then there exists a subjective morphism from X to some variety Y. So Y is a variety of maximal Albanese dimension um, such that um, such that uh, the dimension of Y is less than the dimension of X minus I. I think that should be less or equal. Let me correct it immediately. And W is contained in P plus F upper star of pick zero of Y. And F should match that one, so I got it right this time. 
and in fact, P is some torsion element. So let, let's, let's stare at this for a second and try and figure out what's going on. So um, let's uh, say uh, we, we want to look at sort of one of the most interesting cases. So let's say uh, I is equal to the dimension of X minus 1. So how do um, um, uh, how do components of v dimension of x minus 1 arise? Well, they arise from morphisms from x to y, where y has maximum opposite dimension, and the dimension, so that would say that the dimension of y is going to be less or equal to uh, dimension of x minus dimension of x minus 1, 1. So components of, of V dimension of X minus 1, they naturally appear from curves. Components of V n minus 2 will naturally come from surfaces and so on. Right. So for a curve, of course, you know, saying that it's of maximum albinistic dimension is just saying that the curve is not P1. Pig tau is... Oh, pig tau is the set of torsion elements in pig zero. Right. So, okay. is, is it equal, W is equal to P plus n subtraction of pig zero Y? Uh, no, I, not necessarily. It's contained in there. I'll, I'll do the proof now so we can check. If I'm wrong, it'll be equal to. So this does not prove W is a translation of no, this does not prove it. It's suspicious, but no. Yeah, until, until you're picking up on something, I have not proven that if F is a generic vanishing sheaf, then the cohomology of support loci are tori. And it's, in fact, not true. You need some other condition for that to be true. They, they have to, so, so the fact that they're tori really does come, well, so from Rina and Lazarsfeld, that was really part of their statement about, uh, you know, these loci containing the tangent space, so these loci being linear, and it used, used Hodge theory. Um, but, you know, since what we're using is true for any generic vanishing uh, sheaf, there's no reason to expect Hodge theory in there. Um, so... But, but if it's a W, is a reducible component of it is a sub Oh, okay, 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 okay. So, so if I know that my generic vanishing sheaf is coming from a W of X, then it will be a subtorus, for sure. Yes. So, in fact, in that case, we are expecting, we really are expecting equality. I'm not going to prove it, but you are expecting equality. Um, what I was saying in general is that for generic vanishing sheaves, so. So, so in this statement of the uh, theorem, Um, I do not know. Maybe I have to add some small uh, specification. Uh, so, for example, um, that will be one of the, the next statement. If you, we know that the, this has codimension, some expected codimension. Mm -hmm. If the codimension is the right one, then you would have equality. Uh, for sure. Um, but anyhow, I, I wanted to record that, you know, F a generic vanishing sheaf, it does not imply that these loci are linear. It's certainly true in characteristic zero when it's coming from these omega x's, and it's true in positive characteristic under mild hypothesis. You have to somehow assume that F is related to a canonical bundle, so if it's, if it's coming from a Cartier module and your abelian variety is not pathological, let's say it's ordinary, then they will also be torsion translate of abelian subvarieties. So there is an, uh, uh, a completely algebraic proof uh, that was discovered by Pink and Rossler. So I'll, we'll get to that eventually. But uh, just wanted to make sure that nobody expects that this is true. It's just not true. Okay, so let's get back to the proof of this. Um, somehow I need to magically... 
um, make a variety of maximum Albanese dimension appear. So what do we have? Um, so um, let's write, uh, we have that W is this irreducible component, so I can write that W is P plus, um, uh, let's say, Something's bothering me. Yeah, is that the kernel? Is W is included in P plus the kernel of? No, not the kernel. The pullback. The, uh, P zero. So, so topologically trivial line bundles here. I can pull them back here. Uh, so this is contained in pick zero oh, yeah, of right, X. Right, yeah. Sorry. And hence pick zero of itself and it's Sorry. No problem. Have a question? Okay, so I'm going to start by, I know, so W uh, is an irreducible component of VI of omega x. So by Green and Lazarus style theorem, I know that it's a translate of a torus, and we haven't proven it, but it's actually, so this is um, su subtorus, you know, actually going through the origin in, uh, in, pig zero, uh, in pig zero of x. And this is some torsion point. Wait, wait, Chris, I'm confused. I thought you were proving green lazarus well theorem by using the notion of generic matching sheet. Yes. But, but now you start using W of the P plus P oh. as a segment of green lazarus. Yes, yes, I'm going to use so that. So I'm confused. So, so I'm... I'm using everything we know. So I'm going to use the fact that we know that this is a subtorus, um, and I'm going to use uh, my generic vanishing statements. Um, you could get around probably that this is a subtorus. You could take the minimum subtorus generated by W, probably. But oh, okay. I, 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 uh, I'd need to think about it for a second to make sure that I'm not saying not no, 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 no. I'm, I'm proving this corollary of the result just using everything that we know so far. So, okay, so I'm trying somehow from this component, I'm trying to get this map to appear. So I look at this component, I say, well, I have a subtorus of a hat. So this gives me uh, a map from, let's say, A, um, which is just the Albanese variety of X, to... Uh, uh, let's call it S, which is just the uh, abelian variety dual to the subtorus of pig zero. So if I have an inclusion, P contained in A hat, I just dualize this inclusion to get uh, a subjective map from A to, let's call it S. Now we have a map from X uh, to A, the Albanese map, and we can consider composition, and the natural thing to do is to take this time factorization. So let's call Y this time factorization, and this map will be F. Then this map is finite onto its image, in particular Y is of maximum Albanese dimension, and um, this map is, in fact, an algebraic fiber space. You know, we can assume that F loss star of O of X is equal to O of Y. So I could add that in the hypothesis, but you know, just take this time factorization, it's always true. Um, okay, so, okay, so it seems like a triviality, but there is something to prove. We want to prove that this uh, dimension inequality. This statement, the statement, this statement here is trivial by construction because uh, pick, uh, pick zero of Y is, there's a natural map from, um, uh, pick zero of S, which is T, into pick zero of Y, so that's giving you this inclusion here, W inside here. So the only interesting thing to prove is actually this. And this statement is non-trivial, right? We, we, we looked at it in this example. If we're lo looking for a component of, of V n minus one, then it actually has to come from a curve. So it's, uh, so it's interesting. Okay, so we have to prove the dimension statement, and um, um, uh, okay, so I tried to set it up. Um, but I, I thought we knew that the uh, VI of omega x has um, 
friends are going to die. These are our people. Right. Wasn't this the so? part of the uh, Green of Love that they'll clear up? Yes. So, well, if it's of maximum of this dimension. Oh. Right. So. So if it so this theorem will be clear if it's of maximum Albanese dimension because in that case the dimension of a v n minus one has to have co-dimension n minus one. Uh, it's not completely obvious even in that case. Okay. okay so um, okay so well the, the proof is somewhat instructive too. So I I I, um, I look at omega x tensor p. Right, so um, we know that whenever we um, uh, tensor that by the pullback of something topologically trivial on S, we have interesting cohomology in VI. Okay, so um, we're going to play that off with our generic vanishing theorems. So first of all, if I look at um, our F lower star of omega x tensor p, I claim that this is a sum of Ri F lower star omega x tensor p uh, shifted by minus i. So this is the usual statement of Janos or Collard. Um, however, um, this extra p makes an appearance. So that's why I assumed that p is a torsion element. That's why I'm using the stronger result of Simpson that tells us that P is a torsion element. Because you see, if P is a torsion element, then you can do a cover. How would you prove this result? Well, you take a cover, a cyclic cover corresponding to the torsion element of X. So this guy is a direct summand of the push forward of the structure sheaf of the cyclic cover, and you just apply Collard's theorem to the cyclic cover. So there's an easy argument that says, or that says that if P is a is torsion, topological trivial line blah, blah, then this result holds. And you can prove it in general, but it's, it's more complicated. And I don't think there's a, uh, um, a result in the literature. You'd sort of have to do Hodge theory for forms twisted by P again, and you'd have to show that they behave well under high direct images. So it, it's, it's more a question of convenience. Okay, so we have this, um, I, I'm sorry, yes. I, I understand your argument when P is a torsion, but you were saying in general, blah, 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 what? Okay, so in general, um, Hodge theory works for any topologically trivial line bundle. Also, oh, this is true for any topological? Yes, so you have some oh. unitary local system. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I just didn't know what you meant by it. Yeah. yeah. So it, I don't think it's anywhere in the literature. Well, probably by now it is, but when... So, so what you said was, if P is a torsion, it's an easy argument. Yeah, and if P is non-torsion, you'd have to work this harder. Is, but this is true. That's what yes, it's true. still true, yeah. but you'd have to work harder. Okay, I just didn't know what you were Okay, so, okay, so now, here, uh, let's give this other map a name. Let's maybe call it G. So now, uh, it's also easy to see that R... Uh, uh, K, G lower star of R I, this is one of Collard's statements, is equal to zero for every K greater than zero. So this map here is generically finite. And uh, so um, if you look at higher direct images, they would have to be torsion sheaves on S. And one of these results of Janos, a sort of slightly fancy, a relative version of the result that I already told you, tells you that these sheaves, in fact, have to be torsion free. So they vanish for any k greater than zero. Um, by torsion freeness. Okay, so. What we get is that, uh, so I want to say that HJ 
of Ri f lower star of omega x tensor p tensor g upper star of alpha. Um, I want to claim that this is equal to zero for every uh, j greater than zero and general alpha in pick zero of s. Okay, so it's a bit of a mouthful. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say these sheaves a generic vanishing sheaf, and so one of the statements is, is more precise than this. The uh, not only do do these groups vanish for general alpha in in pig zero of S, they in fact the corresponding V J should have co-dimension J. So the reason why I wrote that down is in order to write in terms of generic vanishing sheaf, I should say that this is the same as HJ, G lower star, RI, F lower star, omega X, tensor P, tensor alpha, and this guy here is my GV sheaf. Since this is a GV sheaf, it satisfies some gen generic vanishing condition. Con condition. Okay, so then I know that if I look at H um, J, and I'm doing the usual shift, I started looking at HIs, and by the way I wrote my spectral sequence, I'll call them HJ. So HJ of omega X tensor P tensor F upper star G upper star of alpha is equal to Okay, well, by this result, it has to be the sum of H J minus I, R I, F low star, omega X tensor P, tensor G upper star of alpha, uh, where this sum goes from I is equal to zero uh, to uh, dimension of x minus dimension of y. Okay, so now it doesn't really matter how far it goes because almost everything inside is zero, right? We've already seen that if alpha is general, these are zero as long as the cohomology index, this number j minus i, is greater than zero. So this is actually equal to, for general alpha, This is actually equal to H zero uh, uh, J F lower star omega X tensor P tensor G star of alpha. Okay, so by assumption, this group is non-zero, right? Because this group is non-zero for everything in W, so for everything of the form P plus uh, F upper star of pick zero of S, right? T is just pick zero of S. So for everything in here, this group is non-zero. So the upshot is that this sheaf here has to be a non-zero sheaf. Okay, so that means this is a torsion-free sheaf. Uh, that means that J must be less or equal to the dimension of the general fiber. So to the dimension of X minus the dimension of Y. A fact that I already illustrated by putting that mark there. Okay, so hopefully that's the inequality that I wanted <laughs> because otherwise... So, uh, if I take the i to this side and call it j, and the dimension of y to this side, and, and put it with a minus, I have the right equality. So, I, I um, yeah. 
and breathe a sigh of, breathe a sigh of release, relief because you know, there's almost a 50-50 chance of getting the wrong inequality at the end. Especially if you start at a certain point by, by reasoning by contradiction then. <laughs> okay, so, so that, that concludes that proof. Um, so, okay, so soon I want to talk about pluricanonical maps of varieties of maximal urbanism dimension, but before I do that, maybe before, before the break, let me do the last um, uh, technical uh, lemma on the structure of these, um, of the cohomological support loci of GV sheets. So we sort of already remarked that the Euler characteristic of F, if F is a generic vanishing sheaf, then the Euler characteristic of F is greater or equal to zero for trivial reasons. Um, it would be nicer if the Euler characteristic was strictly positive, right? So instead of having one cohomology group, H0 of F tensor P, which doesn't vanish, you'd have H0 of F tensor any P doesn't vanish. In particular, H0 of F doesn't vanish. That's not always the case, right? So <coughs> this, um, uh, it's not uh, true that the Euler characteristic of F is greater than zero. For example, F is equal to O of X, right? Uh, o of A. That's definitely a generic vanishing sheaf, but it has um, <coughs> it has trivial Euler characteristic. Okay, but um, I can still say something uh, interesting. So in the case um, in the case so in the case when you have Euler characteristic of f equals zero, then you can focus the most interesting locus to look at is v zero of f, and you sort of want to understand this locus a little bit better. Right, so, um, so we did one example, if you remember, it was some funny example where we had the product of three elliptic curves and we took a Z2 by, uh, by double cover of that and we had some interesting cohomological support loci. And we observed something about the co-dimension of the component of something in V0 was reflected in the fact that that component also existed in higher cohomology loci, in higher VI. So for example, this is an extreme example. If you look at um, um, zero in a hat is the same as V zero of F. And so it has maximal co-dimension. And then the, um, um, so in particular, this is, this is like zero in a hat, it means it's not empty. So what I'm trying to say is that if you have a point of very high co-dimension in V0, then it lives also in much higher uh, cohomologies for it. Okay? So this is an extreme example. It has co-dimension G, it lives in VG as well. It should make you think of some kind of causal complex thingy duality, but... Um, Okay, so, um, so what? Zero? Sorry? Zero. I'm going to write it down. Uh, um, okay, the proof is not too difficult, so I'll call it a proposition, but yeah. Um, so, suppose that F is GV sheaf on coherent sheaf on abelian variety A, and Z is an irreducible component of V0 of F uh, of co dimension of uh, Z inside of A uh, hat equals to K, right? So this, these are contained in A hat, and let's assume that the convention of Z is K. It's only interesting if K is positive, otherwise it's gonna be an empty statement. Um, then I claim that Z is also a component of VK of F. So that's exactly like in this situation. It's a component of V0 of codimension G, 
then it's a component of BG. Do we have a set, like similar statement for BI of F or? No. So it's only for zero? Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if there's any um, intelligent statement for the BI. Just a simple statement, BI F for the image of K and Z links in I plus. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, Sorry. No, no, no problem at all. Okay. Um, and notice uh, that Z is certainly not contained in BK plus 1 of F because components of BK plus 1 of F have codimension at least K plus 1. So not going to happen. Okay, so proof, well, we have to use that it's a generic vanishing sheaf, so let's use one of the properties, and the property I want to use. Did I assume Z is a reducible component? Or? Did I assume what? Z. Yeah, Z, I'm assuming that Z is in a reducible component. I said it, but I didn't write it. Oh, okay. Then the conclusion again, it's in a reducible component. And at the, in the proof, I can almost bet that at a certain point I'm going to localize at a generic point of Z. So um, I probably really want to assume that it's an actual component. Um, of course, if it's not a reducible component, you take the reducible component that contains Z and you get that, and so you get the same kind of statement. But when I do the proof, I, I probably want to assume that I I'm see. looking at. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so, okay, so. No, but you cannot, well, in, in that case, you cannot draw that parameter. So this is the same. Yeah, this is the same as the one. Right? Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Whenever I write this, I'm always slightly concerned that I'm off by a shift. Uh, okay, so maybe when I write it like this, it's supposed to be a zero. Um, uh, you know, so, so just, just like for one example here, right? So what's going on? If F is O of A, uh, D A of O of A is just O of A, and then R S hat of O of A is the same. We computed that. It's R G R S hat O of A minus G. So it's the complex 0, 0, 0, and in G place, you get the structure sheaf of the origin on the dual origin variety. So um, that's why I tend to put a G there. Now, <coughs> I got this wrong, right? Because this is the derived dual. In order for growth indeed duality for it to work well functorally, there should be a shift here. So this should be OA. Now there's a 50 50 chance I got the shift right. It's plus or minus. It's to the left or to the right. I believe it's to the left. So then, when, <coughs> so this has been shifted G places to the left. When I do this, everything that I have in my picture is shifted G places to the left. So this is a G minus G. That's in position zero. So that's what I'm saying. What it's really difficult to keep track of the right um, of the right shift. If you're not sure, you typically do an example like this, and you figure out what the right shift should be. Okay. So I think it's it should be R zero on the notes. It's almost certainly I put R G. Um, if you know what you want to prove, you can usually fix it at a certain point. Okay. So um, so then. We're going to use this to try and compute rs hat of f. So this is um, um, r hom from g into o of a. Um, so why is that? Um, well, I haven't told you what g is. So let's let g be minus 1 a upper star uh, g d a of Okay, so let me try and explain this. 
Rs hat of f um, is the same. Well, okay, so I think I've done this computation before. It's something like this is the same as uh, da rs hat, uh, da hat, da hat of rs hat of f, right? If you dualize something twice, you get the same thing back. Uh, but then this is the same as da hat r s hat of da of f, where now I know that I'm off by a minus one a upper star, and I know that I'm off by a shift by g, but I don't remember exactly where to put it. So the minus one, I could put it on both sides. It's what we're going to work out. But the shift by g plus or minus g, I was almost certainly get that wrong. So up to minus one a and a shift by g, which I, I got right here because I checked the reference, this explains why, how to go from here to here. Okay? So, so the point is that I'm saying something very silly. If rs hat of the dual of f is a sheaf, then rs of f is the dual of a sheaf. That's what I'm saying. Okay, but the dual of coherent sheaf um, have certain nice properties, um, which I will now write down. So I claim that, um, so in particular, ri s hat of f is equal to x i g o of a for every i greater or equal to zero. Okay, so. What do I know? Well, okay, so maybe what I want to think about now, first of all, I want to say I'm going to localize at eta z the generic point of z. So there's this, there's this um, component of b0 that we're considering. I'm going to localize at the generic point of that component. Then once I do that, I know that by cohomology and base change, I know that... Um, uh, um, R uh, S hat of F, in other words, G, um, is um, I want to figure out which one of these has to be supported along Z? Is that always X, I, G, always hat? Let's see. Yes, it has to be, right? Because R, I, yeah, yeah. that has to be, and That's yes, D, A, hat yeah. of that guy. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so... Okay, so now I want to say, I want, I, I'd like to say that um, everything, so RS hat DA of F um, is supported and RS hat of F, both of these are supported uh, on uh, Z. Okay, so for this guy, it's a sheaf, so it's clear what I mean by supported on Z, right? This guy is a complex, so by supported on Z, I mean that the support of each one of the cohomologies is contained in G. And the reason for this is that by cohomology and base change, we know that they are supported inside the low side VI of F, and all of the low side VI of F are contained in V0 of F, and once I localize it at the generic point of Z, I can assume that this is actually Z. So everything inside, the only place where they cannot be non-zero is inside of Z. Uh, so maybe not on in, somewhere in Z. Okay, so 
Now, um, OK, so now I want to use the following fact is that so G is supported on Z. It tells me that X I of G O A hat is equal to 0 for every I lesser or equal to the um, uh, co-dimension of Z to, let's say, K, which is the co-dimension of Z. And then it says that the co-dimension of the support of X time is um, greater or equal to I. Okay, so if you look at the first condition, for example, if Z were the whole variety, then this says nothing, right? But if uh, Z is supported on something of co-dimension K, so for example, think of O of Z, right? So we're doing at the generic point of Z. So Z is a smooth sub-variety of co-dimension K. How would you compute these X I? You, you, write, you write in the local ring, you, you, you take a, a locally free resolution of that, and you take the corresponding, uh, that you, you get some causal complex, you dualize it, and the only non-zero cohomology will be in a degree equal to the co-dimension. Right, so, so you know how to prove this kind of thing. Right? So at the generic point of Z, uh, in fact, this guy here will be locally free, right? So that actually gives you a proof of this co-dimension thing. So in fact, at the generic point of Z, G is locally free of rank R, and then X K will be exactly uh, a sheaf of rank, of the same rank, right? It will be just be, take this, the, 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 fiber of this sheaf over the generic point and dualize it. That's all it is. And in higher co-dimension, well, you get some more interesting uh, behavior. Okay, so, um, okay, so now it's just a matter of reading it off. Um, so, so this tells me, uh -huh, okay, um, so, uh, when I'm looking at H I of R S hat F, I might just well call them these R I S hat F uh, tensor eta Z. Okay, look at these guys. What do I get? I'm getting zero uh, in degrees between zero and K minus one. Then I'm getting possibly something interesting in degree K. And then I have to be getting zero everywhere else, right? Because the support has co-dimension at least Z, at least, at least the degree uh, I. And so if I is greater than K, it won't see the generic point. OK, so. Um, Um, so now I'm supposed to say, ah, yes. Okay, so I still have to tell you why this is actually non-zero, right? So I um, suppose that this was zero, right? Then you see if that group is zero, then the dual of this guy is actually zero everywhere at the generic point. However, I know that the corresponding cohomology groups, what I do know is that HI of F tensor P is non-zero for P and Z general. So if these guys are all zero, then by cohomology and base change, these guys have to be all zero. Okay, so if this guy were equal to zero, that would tell me that H i of F tensor P is equal to zero for every i uh, 
for every i, and here it's an hk, which is probably what you were. Um, right, so, well, no, actually, I know that h0. Okay, so, okay, so let me go over the argument. If, if these sheaves, I know that all but this guy have to be zero, these sheaves. If this one is also zero, then by cohomology based change, they're all zero. I can run the usual inductive cohomology and base change argument. So I, I get that all of the maps are subjective onto these cohomology groups. So all of the cohomology groups are zero. But I know that the H0 one is non zero. So this cohomology group cannot vanish. Then again, by cohomology and base change, running the argument, once I get to here, the map is subjective. It tells me that the corresponding, so applying cohomology, cohomology and base change uh, a first time will tell me that uh, K S hat F tensor eta Z is non-zero. Applying cohomology and base change a second time will now tell me that the map from R K S hat F tensor P, where P is a general point on Z, uh, uh, this tensor K of P to H K of F tensor P, that this map is subjective. So once I know that this guy is non-zero, then these guys are non-zero. Actually, it's an isomorphism, right? The previous one is zero, so this one is an isomorphism. It's not enough that it's subjective, clearly. Oh, it's, it's subjective, but it's an isomorphism. So you, it's sort of a bit strange. You have to apply cohomology and base change twice. Once to deduce that the corresponding RKS hat is non zero, and once to deduce that the actual cohomology group is non zero. I'm sorry, Chris. Yes. Okay, so let, let's go over that quickly. So, so that's a general fact about X sheaves. So I know that, so we're doing, first of all, we argued that RS hat of F is some kind of X sheaf. Okay, so now we know that that sheaf that we're taking X of is supported on Z. And Z has codimension K. So by general theorems, I tried to wave my hands to say a few words why that general theorem should be true. So by general theorem, that's not too hard to prove. That tells you that when I look at this x i, it's zero before dimension k, the codimension of z. Oh, okay. And then just in general, for any sheaf on a smooth, coherent sheaf on a smooth variety, the codimension of the support of the x i is at least i. Since the dimension, uh, um, so since the codimension of z is k, when i is bigger than k, Again, you cannot be at the generic point of Z. Oh, okay. So okay. it's for two different reasons. This, this is always true, and this is because the support is contained in Z. So it has high codimension. Okay. So it can only live there, and then yeah. uh, since it cannot be zero, it has to live there. Okay. Thank and then cohomology and base change allows yeah. you to, to conclude. Okay, so that's it. I'll take a break, and then I'll talk about pluricanonical maps. So We'll, we'll go away from the formal statements and we'll go back to more geometric statements. Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about is pluricanonical maps. So just to fix the notation, what's a pure canonical map? Uh, well, it's a typical thing that you study in variational geometry. C sub M A X is a rational map from X to the corresponding projective space. This is just corresponding to the linear series M K X. How is this map defined? So if S0 through S N is a basis, or of course, this is just kind of silly to define in terms of basis, but why not? of H0 of omega x to a tensor m, then this map is just defined by sending a point x to uh, evaluating these sections. 
at x. And of course, it's a broken arrow. It's not defined at everywhere. If a point is a zero of all of these sections, if a point is in the base locus of mkx, then the map isn't defined. And you know, when you go from one transition to, uh, from one uh, coordinate chart to another, the uh, transition functions of the pre-canonical line bundle don't matter because you're landing in projective space. So this is just the usual notation. Um, the Kodara dimension is the maximum of the dimensions of phi mkx of x, assuming uh, that these maps are defined at least for some m. So if they're not defined, we, if they're never defined, we said that kx is minus infinity if h0 of m kx is equal to 0 for every m greater than 0. Okay, so uh, uh, the typical situation that you have in mind is if the dimension of x is equal to 1, then the quadratic dimension of x is minus infinity or 0 or 1 according to the genus being 0. So if it's a rational curve, then the canonical de has degree minus 2. These spaces are always empty, so the quadratic dimension is minus infinity. If it's an elliptic curve, then the quadratic dimension is 0. And if the genus is greater or equal to 2, then it's a curve of general type, so the quadratic dimension is 1. So in general, the quadratic dimension of x belongs to, it can either be minus infinity, 0, 1, all the way up to dimension of x. And if the quadratic dimension of x is the same as its dimension, then we say it's maximal. We say that x is of general type. So in this case, is it known that if it's of general type, in fact, phi m k of x is birational for every m sufficiently big. So the definition only guarantees that the map it has to be generically finite. The dimension of the image has to be equal to the dimension of x. But what, uh, what we're actually saying is that at a certain point, the maps become actually birational in this case. Um, so maybe I should mention that if the dimension of x is equal to 1, effectively 2 or 3, then phi m kx is birational. So I'm assuming that we're in the case of general type, is birational. Uh, if m is greater or equal to 3, respectively, m greater or equal to 5, and m greater or equal to, what is it, 77, if I remember correctly? 77. So this result is, in characteristic 0, is due to Bombieri. And this result for free folds is due to uh, Junkai Chen. Uh, and um, uh, Meng Chen. Okay. And in fact, it's known uh, uh, that for any dimension n, there exists an integer m, which depends only on the dimension, such that if x is smooth, complex projective, Um, of general type, then phi m k x is birational for every m greater or equal to this constant m. Uh, but this constant that we know exists, m k 
cannot, we don't know how, how to compute it. The given methods only say that there exists such an M, they do not actually compute it. So if you saw my lectures last, uh, last year, uh, you know all about this. Um, so, um, right, so even in dimension three, it's very hard to compute this. In high dimension, we know that such an integer exists, but we have no clue even how to compute it. So um, compare that to the theorem that I told you uh, in the first lecture. So this is a theorem due to Lahoth, uh, Jiang, and Tirabasi. So if X is a smooth complex projective variety of maximal Albanese dimension and general type, then C M K X is birational for any M greater or equal to three. Right, so um, that's sort of keep this in mind, that's really striking behavior for varieties of maximum Albanese dimension. Right? From this point of view, they're behaving almost just like curves. Right? I'm not saying that it's as easy as to prove it with curves, but they, they behave like So any questions on the statement or on the uh, remarks I made about Kodaro dimension? So, I want to prove this theorem, but I want to prove it avoiding the really uh, annoying technical details. So I want to give you an idea of the proof uh, without doing, I want to give a complete proof, which gives you a very good idea even of that case, but avoids all the difficult technical details. So uh, I will prove it, prove this for m greater or equal to six. So you'll see in the proof that the method uh, works if the other characteristic of omega x or better maybe of a low star of omega x, I just say omega x is positive and m greater or equal to three. So remember that by generic vanishing theorems, we know that the other characteristic of omega x for a variety of maximum Albanese dimension is greater or equal to zero. So in the case when the other characteristic is zero, we have some, you know, you have to look carefully at the structure of V zero of omega x. And for example, you'll have to probably use that last result that I mentioned, which said something interesting about this low star. But you have to, uh, it's a similar proof, but it's just more technical. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to somehow construct many pluricanonical sections in 6K. So I want, I want to show that 6KX is birational. So I need to find many sections in here. So the first step should be to produce some sections, to use some of our non-vanishing results to produce some sections. Um, so, let's consider the following. I'm going to consider F to be A low star of omega X. So, maybe I should say A from X to A is the Albanese morphism, which is generically finite onto its image. Now, I want to look at the coherent sheaf. F is A low star omega x tensor the asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaf of kx. Okay, so I don't remember if I defined what this ideal sheaf is, so I will explain it, but maybe let me first use the formal properties of this, give you a proof, and then I'll go over what this asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaf is and why certain formal property holds. So, um, uh, uh, okay, so uh, 
first claim is that this is a non-zero sheaf, non-zero coherent sheaf on uh, A. So why is that? Well, the map is generically finite. So on some open set, this is just a line bundle. On the complement of the support of this ideal sheaf, it's just a line bundle. And if you restrict that set further, this map is a tau. So the push forward of a line bundle under a tau map uh, is non-trivial. Non there's nothing to it. But remember, all of our non-vanishing criterions for generic vanishing sheaf require uh, that the sheaf be non-trivial. OK. So now the next thing I claim, and this I will prove later when I remind you what the definition of a syntactic multiplier ideal sheaf is, is that um, H i of uh, A lower star omega x squared tensor i A of x uh, tensor p is equal to 0 for every i greater than 0 p in p0 of a. So this is, uh, um, I'll go over the proof, but this is uh, simply uh, nadal vanishing for asymptotic multiplier D sheaf. Well, I'll, I'll go over the proof. So I'm just, let me just write it as a claim. If you're familiar with multiplier D sheaf, you say, sure, that's well known. Okay, so what does that tell us? If you ground the claim for the time being, all higher cohomology vanish. So that tells us that H0 of A lower star omega x squared tensor this ideal sheaf tensor P is non-zero for every P in pick zero of A. Right? This is one of the criterion that we proved, right? So in fact, notice that these cohomology groups, they all have the same dimension, right? They're all equal to the Euler characteristic of A low star blah, 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 tensor P, which is equal to the Euler characteristic without tensoring by the trivial line bundle, if you want. Euler characteristic is always the same. So these H zeros are invariant. The argument we gave was that if this number was zero, then all of the cohomology is zero, so the fourier mukai transform of that sheaf is trivial. Right? So in other words, this vanishing is telling you that this is a generic vanishing sheaf, but even stronger than generic vanishing. Actually, all high cohomology vanish. OK, so, so this is, is not the most sophisticated kind of non-vanishing that we've seen. OK, so. So now, um, fix u in an open subset of x such that a restricted to u is a tau. So throw away the exceptional locus, throw away the ramification locus. And uh, let's also assume that this ideal sheaf uh, restricted to you is uh, trivial. So I'm going to. Sorry. Yes. Klaus, the reason why you take omega x square, could it be three, four, or you just want to have some. Well, okay, if you, if you, so in general, I think that the, the best way to answer that, and we'll use it in a second, uh, in general, what you want to do is you want to take. Uh, omega x to the m tensor i asymptotic of kx times m minus 1. Or more generally, omega the x twist, twisted by a divide tensor o x d twisted by the asymptotic multiplier sheaf of d as long as d is big. So, so sort of, you cancel, you play these two off together. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll make it precise. I'll, I'll, when I give you the proof, I'll show you how this works, how it just reduces to cover mat of Vivek Vanish. Okay, so my D is always going to be M minus 1 Kx. So it's going to be, I'm going to do it with 2Kx, with 4Kx, and maybe with 6Kx. Uh, okay, so, so now I'm looking for sections in here that can separate two general points. So I'm going to restrict. Where do I pick my two general points? Well, two general points means points in an open subset of X. I want a nice open subset. Let me throw away everywhere, every point where the map is not et al. And let me throw away everything where this, this ideal sheaf in O of U will be trivial in some open subset. Okay, so, so I, essentially, I'm not gonna worry about the base locus of K of X, right? Anyhow, the pluricanonical map will not be defined at the base locus of K of X, so asymptotic base locus. So it's good that I'm throwing it away. And so let's pick a point X in here. Um, okay, so, so I would like to sh say, um, uh, so, um, uh, for uh, general uh, P, I may assume, assume that uh, um, 2kx tensor is multiplied ideal sheaf tensor P uh, has a section not vanishing at x. Okay, so I need to be slightly more precise about the open subset. But let's think about this. Am I saying anything deep? Not really. You see, suppose that we have one section in here, then shrinking you a little bit, I certainly have, forget about the P for now, I certainly have a section of this that doesn't vanish at any point in an open subset of U, okay? So pick one, uh, so, so really, so let's, let's throw away, uh, remove the base locus of 2kx tensor i kx tensor a upper star of some p0. So then, you, know, you fix one of these, remove the base locus, then outside of the base locus, clearly, by definition of base locus, there's a section that doesn't vanish at the point. I'm not saying anything, anything deep. Okay, so now, um, what I want to do. Right, so for a fixed P0, so that means that once I remove that, every point in here has a section in there that doesn't vanish at the point. Uh -huh. So then, for general P, where this general depends on X, so if you, if you want to think about it too much, exactly what general means, the open set is fixed one, once and for all, but for every point in the open set, when I say general P, that general depends on X. Okay, we may assume that this section doesn't vanish at x. What's the rationale here? The rationale is I have a section with p0 that doesn't vanish at x, and assuming that that p0 was general, I can deform the section. If it doesn't vanish at when, when p is equal to p0, it won't vanish for nearby p's, right? But the p's for which it doesn't vanish will depend on x. I'm, I'm, that's something I'm willing to live with. Okay, so, so this is an open subset V sub X contained in A hat. You're forcing me to be precise here. Yeah. But I, th I, 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 I think I can make it. Okay? So now I wanna use these sections. Uh, so this, this is not very satisfactory. We've done very little, but at least we've got some sections working. So now I wanna, I wanna look at the map 
2 kx tensor i kx tensor a upper star of p times 2 kx tensor i kx tensor a upper star of p prime into 4 kx uh, tensor a upper star p plus p prime. Okay? So, you know, the, the image of these sections will actually be sections in here that vanish along i kx squared. I'm not worrying about that too much, yeah? Um, so, so I have in here one section, S sub p, which does not vanish at x. I have in here another sub section, S sub p prime, which doesn't vanish at x. So here, p and p prime are in V of x. So I get in here a section, the image of these two sections, let's just call it SP times SP prime, which doesn't vanish at x. Okay? Now, I'm allowing p and p prime to be in V of x. V of x is an open subset of a hat. So what's V of x plus V of x? Our intuition comes from Euclidean world and that doesn't quite match. But in the Zariski topology, when you have two non-empty open, uh, non open subsets and you add them together, you get the whole abelian variety. Think of your subset, it looks like, I don't know, product of two elliptic curves. You're taking out some factors like this and then. <laughs> okay, so the upshot is that uh, Okay, so, uh, so we get a section uh, um, 4 kx plus a upper star q uh, has a section not vanishing at x for any q in a hat. Now, this is looking a bit better, right? So in particular, for Q, e, the trivial one, 4KX has a section not vanishing at X. Okay, but now that's not what I really want to do, right? What do I need? What I need uh, let's write it here. We need uh, that for x and y in u, there exists a section t in 6kx such that uh, t of x is equal to 0, t of y is, or non-zero and t of y is equal to 0, right? So in order to show that the map 6kx is birational, I need to show you that for any two points in an open subset, I can tell these two points apart. Maybe I should say different because if they're the same, I won't be able to do that. For any two, I pick two different points in U, I should be able to tell them apart using sections of, of 6K. So this is, this is a good first step towards that. So now, let me, let me go back here and think about this a second. So actually, the section that I've produced is um, a section in here. Really, it's tensor. Um, uh, okay, let, let, let's, I'm going to get it slightly wrong, so, okay, so let me, let me just say it differently. Um, so, in fact, we get sections, that section that I produced is, in fact, is a section of 4 kx and so the asymptotic multiply ideal of 3kx uh, uh, tensor a upper star of q. So why I really want to make this observation because this, thing, this is the kind of thing that gives rise to a generic vanishing sheaf so I can use all the theory that I have. And so 
So um, since I haven't really defined these asymptotic multiplier deals, I can't explain it yet, but let me at least say a couple of words. You see, the point is that this takes into account the asymptotic base locus. The asymptotic base locus is less restrictive than the actual base locus, possibly, right? It's only the same if, for example, the pluricanonical ring is generated in degree three, then it will be the same. Otherwise, it will actually be smaller. So this asymptotic base locus is from the definition that I'll give you in a few minutes, we'll see that this is clearly contained in the base locus of 4kx. Just by definition, it follows immediately that it's contained in there. Do you mean 3kx? mkx where m is greater or equal to 3. Uh, but I thought like uh, this i of asymptotic. It's oh, certainly I true, know. yes. But it, this is also, this is easier to check. I haven't done it, right? But, but I, I claim that this is the case. In fact, it's contained in the base locus. So, uh, so when we define asymptotic multiplier of the Oshie, I'll try to convince you of this fact. For example, you're bothered by the four versus three. But the, four, the base locus with four should be bigger than the base locus with three. We're expecting it to be bigger. Well, maybe not, but it's certainly bigger than this one. And I'll show you why. Okay, so. So if you have a section of 4kx plus a plus r of q, it certainly vanishes along the base locus. And since this base locus is more restrictive than this multiplier deal sheet, then we're in business. OK, so, so I need to, when I talk about these asymptotic multiplier deal sheets, I need to show you why they compare. OK, so, um, so I better find where I'm in the notes. Um, um, ah, yes. So now. I want to look at the following short exact sequence. Zero to omega x to the four, tensor the ideal sheaf of three k x, tensor the ideal of the point x, goes to omega x to the four, tensor the multiplier ideal sheaf of three k x, goes to evaluation at the point x, goes to zero, and maybe I want to twist everywhere by the pullback of Q. Okay, so now what do I know? Again, by NATO vanishing, higher we have H0 here, which may be interesting, so higher cohomology of this guy is always equal to zero. Now, we know, we have proven that for every value of Q, we have a section of this that does not vanish at the point x. So we know that the mapping cohomology, which is just a copy of C, is subjective. Higher cohomology of a point is also zero. And so that tells me that higher cohomology of this fancy sheaf is zero for every i greater than zero. So again, this is a generic vanishing sheaf. In fact, it's better than generic vanishing. All higher cohomology is zero, twisted by any q. It's a non-zero sheaf, clearly. And so we get sections in here too. So by the same argument, for any point Y, which is different from X, but belongs to this open set U, as I said before, right? Because now I'm twisting by the ideal sheaf of X, so if I want to make sure that it's locally free, I have to throw that point away too. Uh, what do we get? Uh, um, and for general P, um, depending on y, uh, there exists uh, a section uh, in um, H0 of 4kx tensor this 
has a multiply ideal tends to I X tends to A alpha star of P such that S of Y is non-zero. Okay? And again, this is for general P, and the general P depends on Y. So now, what you have to do is you have to consider the map from 2KX uh, tensor I of KX uh, tensor uh, A upper star P prime times 4KX tensor I of 3KX tensor I of X tensor A upper star of P into 6kx. So now, you see here, here I, I can pick a section. Yeah, twist, twist. Twist, twist. Kx tensor A upper star P prime. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm after that one at the end, but it's going to work for all P's, in yeah, fact. So, yeah, yes, yes. yes. I'm arguing the same uh, P, P prime plus P prime. P prime. Yes, yes. Tensor A I'm going to argue for the, in the same way that since P and P prime belong to open subsets, then this actually covers the whole of A dual. And now here, in here I have a section S which belongs to the ideal of X. So I think of it as a section that vanishes at X, but it does not vanish at Y. And here I have a section, let's call it S prime, which does not vanish at Y. Y is a point in U, so for uh, there exists uh, an open subset of A hat depending on Y, such that I can construct such a section. And so when I take the product of these sections, uh, S prime times S of X will clearly be zero, and S prime times S of Y will be non-zero, and I've succeeded in my goal. So the only th thing that remains uh, is to show you that uh, a few properties of these asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaves. I should try and convince you that these asymptotic multiplier sh ideal sheaves give us vanishing. And I should try and convince you that um, they relate well to the state. To these as the, zero section, the zero locus of these ideals relates well to the base locus of uh, multiples of kx, where the multiple is anything greater or equal to that. I have a stupid question. Yes. So since I multiply multiplier asymptotic multiplier ideal sheet, you call it mm -hmm. like I of just double my kx uh -huh. and I of double my kx. So my naive guess would be I of double my of two kx. How come it becomes three? Well, let me. Okay, 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 so, so. Sorry, no. <laughs> so what, what would be obvious is that these, okay, so now I'm sort of granting the proof and now we're discussing asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaf. What would be obvious is that the image of this is an I of KX squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the question is how does that relate with I of two KX? Maybe the relation doesn't, right, or even free kx, right? Yeah. It's not clear that the relationship goes the right way. You see, what could easily happen is that the asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaf of kx is trivial, but of 2kx is non-trivial. Oh. So it's not, the inclusion goes this way, subadditivity of asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaves. So, just because it's coming from there, you don't conclude that it vanishes along I of 2kx. Mm. What you do is you observe that it's in here, so it vanishes. Since it's in here, let's, let's not worry about these, the, these guys here. You, you would conclude that it's in the ideal of the linear series for kx. Oh. Now, the point is that the ideal of the linear series for kx is always deeper uh, than the ideal series of the asymptotic uh, 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 multiplier ideal sheaf corresponding to 4kx, uh -huh. which is always deeper than the one corresponding to uh, 
3 kx or any, mod, any number, even rational number you can put, which is smaller than 4. So this is the kind of inclusion. So that, that's, that's what I'll try to convince in a second. The best thing I can do is start by defining these uh, multiplier additions. Yeah. Once you that, I have to agree with yeah. Okay, great. So um, whose argument is this? Uh, so in this version that I'm explaining, yeah. it's uh, me and Alfred Chan. Oh. And you know, then people work really hard that cleaning it up and making it precise. I mean, the, the basic idea is exactly the same, but actually taking care of all the details is a lot of work. So, yes, and the big details is uh, Lahoth, uh, Jang, and Tirabasi. You know, getting to the optimal statement often takes a lot of work. Right? Yeah, no, but this, you know, like uh, finding, you know, this, this kind of function. Right? Yeah. Okay, so let me try and define, um, I'm wondering what generality to do with it. Should I, should I do it for MKX or should I do it for D? Which, okay, let me do it for D. D, which you're thinking as MKX, but it could be something else. Um, then let me try and define, or not try, let me just do it. Let me define the asymptotic multiplier ideal sheaf of D. So how do you do this? Well, <coughs> this. I'm curious, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. Sorry. So at the more naive level, so your idea is that, that you have some section twisted by this P, but that somewhere on Earth, this also subset, you know, like a, that's the thing. But when you multiply it, the, this you write this v x plus v x yeah. is equal to a half. You know, like, so that's yeah. that's the idea. That's the real yeah. That's the, the kind of thing. So, but but then making it sharp is another matter. Yes. This is yes. the point. Right. Uh, I, and you and you saw that I needed to start with two to use a strong vanishing statement. If I try to start with one, I, I know that I would have at least one value with a section, but I don't know that I have an open subset. Mm. So if I don't have an open subset, then I have to look at, maybe I get some geometry. Maybe my variety is fibered over something, some other variety, and I need to look at that again. But we certainly don't do that. Okay, let's, let's move on to multiply ideal sheet. Uh, so this is, if you don't remember it, it's useful to be reminded it's a useful tool. Okay, so, so first of all, let me define the ideal sheaf of the linear series PD. So what does, well, this is a divisor on a smooth variety. Say this is a linear series, so how would you define this ideal? You have your variety X, you take mu X prime, a log resolution of PD. P is not prime, it's just a number. Uh, what does that mean? So X prime has to be smooth. The exceptional divisor, has, the exceptional locus has to be a divisor with simple normal crossings. And when I pull back the linear series PD, I can write it as a moving part MP plus a fixed part FP. And uh, so this is the fixed part. And it has simple normal crossings. And this is the moving part which is base point three. In particular, it's net. <coughs> and now, if I'm assuming that my divisor D is big, then not only it's net, but it will also be big as soon as P is sufficiently big. Right, so for some P, some multiple would define a barational map, and so the, the moving part still defines a barational map, so it has to be big. Okay, so then I set my ideal sheaf of, um, so actually I want to define one over P, P, D, of one over P, P, D, 
will be the push forward of Ox prime Kx prime over x minus the round down of Fp over P. <coughs> so what is this multiply deal shift doing? It's somehow it's measuring the, uh, the base locus of the linear series PD. Okay? And notice that this is numerically equivalent or Q linear equivalent to Kx prime over X plus the fractional part of Fp over P plus the moving part Mp over P. And what you should be observing is that this guy here is KLT. And this guy here is Nefan Big. So this is the situation where you can apply Kavamata Vivek vanishing. So first of all, Ri, mu law star, Ox prime, Kx prime over x minus Fp over P is equal to zero for i greater than zero. And also, you get that if you look at uh, hi of kx prime minus fp over p. So I took this and it just added the pullback of k of x from downstairs. So this is zero, again, by Kavamata Vivek vanishing. But by vanishing of these high direct images, this is the same as hi of kx tensor the ideal of 1 over p, pd. Okay? So I have a vanishing statement. Now, and luckily, I don't have the double lines like I was promising. I have this 1 over p, pd, instead of double lines of p. So I need to define it. Okay, so now, let me make the following remark. Is that... Um, the uh, asymptotic multiply ideal sheaf of 1 over PQ, PQD, is clearly contained in the multiply, uh, contains the multiply ideal sheaf of 1 over P, PD for any two integers P and Q. Okay, so why is that? It's very easy. Suppose that we are on a common resolution of both linear series. Then you see the, uh, this is because if I look at the fixed locus of PD and I take Q times that, that will be greater or equal to the fixed locus of uh, QPD. Just there's a natural multiplication map from one linear series to the other, and this one is a complete linear series, so the fixed locus is smaller. Well, then, when I, when I uh, push forward those two objects, I can compare them directly. There's nothing to it. Okay, so I can look at the ideal sheaf of D. Then I know that that contains the ideal sheaf of 1 half 2D contains the ideal sheaf of 1 over 6, 6D, ideal sheaf of 1 over P factorial, P factorial D. I've got it wrong, right? More divisible gets bigger. Ah. This is good, right? Because we don't want a decreasing sequence of ideals. We want an increasing sequence ideal. So these stabilize. So by definition, this is the union of I of 1 over P factorial, P factorial D. And um, since the sequence stabilizes, it's actually equal to I of 1 over P factorial, <coughs> P factorial D for any P sufficiently big. And if you think about it a little bit, you don't need the uh, P factorial there, right? Because you, 
well, you have to sort of do this sort of zones lemma kind of argument, but it, it's, okay. So that's, that's how you define the asymptotic multiple ideal sheaf. Since it matches one of these guys at finite, finite stage, there's your vanishing theorem already. Okay, so, so I've explained to you why, um, uh, why we have the vanishing that we need. I've explained to you what the definition is. The last thing that I should explain to you is, for example, why is the base locus of uh, M K X greater or equal to the asymptotic multiply ideal sheaf of C uh, K X uh, for any C um, while when it's said this way uh, uh, for any C um, less or equal to M. So what I, what do I mean to say here? I, the, this is a base locus, this is an ideal. Yeah. If I want to compare them, I want to say that this, uh, so if I look at the ideal corresponding to this base locus, so this is just where these sections vanish. Okay, Here, here's, so I want to say that this is deeper than that. In other way, words, I want to say that H0 MKX will be equal to H0 MKX tensor I C K. Okay, so, uh, and if you're bothered by the C outside, just make C an integer and just do it this way. Okay, so, okay, so let's, let's think about what we're saying. Um, well, to compute this guy here, what am I looking at? I'm looking at, uh, 1 over P <coughs> times the linear series corresponding to C, P, K, X for P sufficiently big and divisible. Here, for this guy here, I'm looking at the series M, K, X. Instead of dividing by P here, I'm going to multiply by P here. And I'm going to compare these two linear series. So now... So I need to compare, show you that these two linear series compare favorably. So now, yes. So now the base locus of, so P times the base locus of MKX is greater or equal to the base locus of PMKX. What I should really be saying, I should be going to the resolution and what I should really be saying is that P times, on this common resolution, P times FM is greater or equal to FMP. That just follows uh, from the fact that I have an inclusion of this linear series in that one, so this base locus will be bigger. Okay, so... Um, So then um, you can think of this thing here as coming from, uh, we want to write this as C over M, M. So this will be greater or equal to C over M, F, M, P, just because C over M is a number which is less or equal to 1. That's, that's who there is to it. This, uh, uh, point is supposed to be that it's not very deep, but it's a very effective formalism. So, uh, uh, can we make a similar statement for, not for the general type, but uh, let's say maximal alternative dimension. Yes. Correct. So, um, first of all, maybe I should say two words about what the Ithaca vibration is. So the Ithaca vibration uh, 
uh, is the, the stable birational map. Now that we know that the canonical ring is finally generated, it's a lot easier to define. So uh, you look at the canonical ring, R of kx, and so this is the direct sum of H0 M kx, M greater or equal to zero. And we know that this is generated in some finite degree. So let's say generated in degree uh, uh, um, M zero, then the eta vibration is a map from X to phi, it's not defined everywhere, I guess, phi M zero kx of x, it has some nice properties. So you could resolve the indeterminacies of this map to make it into a morphism if you want. So let's write it, let's resolve the indeterminacy, let's call z the image, let's write it this way. Then what are the properties? So dimension of z is equal to the Kodera dimension of x. And if I look at the general fiber, then the Kodari dimension of a general fiber is equal to zero. I think that's all the, uh, the properties that you need to characterize. And it's ejective with connected fibers. I'm not going to write that. Okay, so again, you can ask the question, well, okay, so you could be uh, very aggressive and ask the question, can I predict in what degree this ring will be generated? The answer is no, but you can predict in what degree you, you can hope to uh, predict in what degree the, the map becomes irrational. So this is actually a deep question, the answer to which is not known in arbitrary dim dimensions. So uh, conjecture, uh, uh, fix n equals dimension of x, there exists some m0 which depends only on n such that phi m0 kx is birational, I stress birational, so I'm not claiming that it's the canonical ring is generated in that degree, birational to the eta vibration. So I forget uh, the full generality to which this is known, but I think it's known if n is less or equal to three. That I'm pretty sure. I don't know if it's wrong. In fact, I'm sure it's not known in general. So for example, answering this question would uh, sort of like in dimension four, the most, the hardest case will probably be the case of Kodari dimension zero. Can you say, so open I think, uh, dimension of x equals four, uh, Kodari dimension of x equals zero, what's the minimum m such that a zero of m kx is non-zero? I, I, I think, I'm pretty sure this is open. Dimension three, it was solved by Kavamata, but the you know, you have classification of terminal singularities, you can do Riemann and Rock kind of arguments, but the answer is something like, I don't know, 13 factorial, something like that. But best known estimate, so it's big. And these things typically grow like double exponentially or something, I don't know how fast they grow, right? So it's like looking for the number of far nodes in a certain dimension. But, uh, but I have a question, even if, if I assume that the X of general type, uh, like- uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 How do you know, for, like your theorem tells you that uh, there is a section. So what's the uh, difference between that question and- So this my theorem question? does not tell you that there's a section unless you know that it's of general type. Yeah, but if for general type, why is it so easier? Well, you have a lot more to work with, right? Asymptotically, you have sections. So, uh, there's a hope. <laughs> you have something to work with. 
it's a bit it's a bit like saying you have a you have a projective variety or you have a variety like a projective variety at least you have an ample line bundle which you can use to prove stuff about cohomology etc if you just have a Kähler variety stuff is harder right no no that's not coming <laughs> like, okay well uh, I, i'm happy to talk to this at length with you but well, let me let me state the theorem so uh, yeah. So this is this is not known. Uh, there's a lot of work around this. If you if you if you give me some, you know, if you say, for example, the fibers of the eta kappa vibration are curves or have some nice property, then maybe there is an answer. Yes. So if x is of maximum Albanese dimension, then uh, this number m zero. Um, is equal to four, and that's sharp. For m zero equal to three, there exists example where three k of x is not uh, the eta perturbation. Could happen that three k x is not the eta curve. Of course, in that case, the dimension of x will be less than the dimension of x. It won't be of general type because the theorem for the general type case is that. And again, this is due to Lahoth, uh, Jiang, and Sirabas. Is that the same argument? Same, but more work, yes. A similar argument. Your proofs that are like the argument you gave. Yes. It's not clear, right? You have to do something slightly different. You have to look. Well, because you won't have this vanishing on the node. This won't vanish because k of x is no longer big. You have to look at the eta k vibration. Oh. It will be big relative to the eta k vibration. The image of the eta k vibration is another variety of maximum abundance in dimension. So what you, the game you play is you take these kinds of sheaves and you push it forward to the image of the eta kappa vibration. Mm -hmm. There they become generic vanishing sheaves. Oh. Now you're a bit messed up because they, you push yeah. sword twisted by some P, so you have to, you have to work your way around. I mean that sort of circular argument. I don't know which one is you know, eta kappa vibration. And only for eta kappa vibration, I will have the big sheaves. So I, I'm not clear. No, so, so the kind of argument you would write, you start with X. Yeah. And your variety A. You look at the eta k vibration, Z. The fibers have quadratic dimension zero, right? Oh. So uh, by a theorem that we'll do next time, the image of the fibers are a billion subvarieties of A. Mm. So you look at the map A mod K, and this is something of maximum Albanese dimension. Oh. Oh. Okay, so now on here, you want to look at sheaves of the form A low star, uh, sorry, uh, F, F low star of omega x to the k, something like that. Now, even if you just have squared, the nice thing is omega x itself is not big, but it's sort of big with respect to the eta k vibration. It contains the pullback of an ample Q divisor on Z. So this kind of thing will have collar vanishing. So you can hope for this kind of thing to do the same kind of argument that we did then. There are a few technical details that you have to. Many points. I thought it was similar. But the argument is similar. There's a few technical details that come up, but not not that many. In fact, maybe for 6K, the argument is almost the same when you try and make it ultra precise, you can only get to four. It, it's quite similar. The only thing that doesn't work is you don't get vanishing of this on the nose. You need to push it forward further where this thing becomes big. Okay, look at that. We're out of time. So I'll stop here and um, next time I'll tell you something about the um, uh, CNM conjecture for varieties of maximum uh, Albanese CNM? Uh,
was it due to when or was it? Let's see. It's the thing relating the Kodera dimension of uh, ah, so yeah, like Ithaca. Ah. Yeah, Ithaca. Ah. Yeah. Yes, yes. But in the case of yeah, abelian varieties, I think it was formulated by one. Yes. 